Hello, this is Jessica Pettit, and who do I have the privilege of interviewing today? Uh, my name is Nick Franco. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm currently based out of Spokane, Washington. Dun, 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 dun. Thank you so much for being with us, Nick. When we started doing these interviews or started the conversations, one of the things I've been trying to do is two big concepts, there's no wrong answer, rolling around in my brain, and I want to know what you think about them. Okay. First one is diversity dividend. So I first started hearing this term when people were like, well, what, why do I have to do diversity training? Like, what's the profit margin on it or something? So thinking about investment, action, or return, what does diversity dividend mean to you? Um, I think diversity dividend, um, in terms of like what you can profit from, I, there's a there's so much that we don't know and the way that we figure out that we don't know a whole lot is when we meet and interact with ideas and people and things that are different mm -hmm. from us. Um, and so I think that's how we learn and grow as people. And I think that's how you learn and grow as an organization is when you're confronted with things that you didn't know you didn't know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When uh, recently in a conversation, I was talking about know what you know, know what you know, what you know, you don't know. And then there's everything else. And I came up with a new category and it's know what you knew because mm. it might be different now, mm -hmm. right? Like things change and evolve. So you knew that at some point, but now you don't. Yeah. Um, awesome. Okay. Next big concept is asterisks, other duties assigned. <laughs> so these may be things that are given to you that you're not actually rewarded for, or these are things you could take on on your own. What does asterisk other duties assigned mean to you? Um, I, I think it's the, you know, in, in my role um, as a diversity person, a professional gay um, on my campus, it, there's, there are things that people don't know and sometimes don't want to know or don't want to actually take on because um, these topics can be heavy, especially when you're supporting people developing initiatives. And so um, I get to do other duties as assigned is really all of that emotional, tends to be a lot of that emotional labor mm -hmm. um, or even, you know, being the spokesperson for every gay and trans and non-binary and et cetera person um, on committees. So it's a lot of committee work, um, a lot of advice giving. And, you know, I recently have reviewed my job description and I'm actually submitting for um, reconsideration of my job duties and maybe reclassification of my job title um, because I find that I'm just doing more and more of this. These other duties as assigned are now becoming a, a, like essential components of my job. Um, but yeah, that's what comes to mind. Excellent. That's another activity that I usually recommend folks do is that you don't even, you don't have to go to HR, right? <laughs> but just if you're a supervisor or a manager, have the people you work with actually write down what they think they do in their job. And then there's usually a gap between the job description, the gap that the supervisor thinks that they're doing, and then the person who's doing the work, what they think they're doing. And is there a way to close the gap or reward kind of that marginal work that may not even be in the job description? Great idea. And sorry you have to do that. No. <laughs> it comes with the work. It does come with the work, which is an excellent transition. Look at you, professional. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to focus on different things about each person that I interview with in their work or their identities, etc. And I did not know that I would be well deep into season four, but here we are. And no one has repeated anything yet. And the thing that you wrote in your pre-qualification survey that really stood out to me, first off, I want you to talk about uh, cultural humility, which is something I talk about as well. But you wrote, I am a non-binary, but I'm read as a cis man. I'm mixed race, but I'm read as white about 70% of the time. And we were just talking about to be in a diversity, equity, and inclusion space, knowing that you are misread or marginalized at least 70% of the time, and yet still holding that space, is first off demonstrative of cultural humility, but also your style and how you are called to doing this work. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I, I wrote um, as part of the NASFA Student Affairs Organization uh, 
the multiracial knowledge community published a ebook. And so they asked different uh, professionals in the field to write about their experiences of being mixed race in student affairs or just in their personal lives. And one of the things I talked about um, or framed it as is this, um, this paradox that um, I, am, I am both not white and not a person of color and also both of those things at the same time. So I am neither and I am both. They are both true and they are both in conflict mm. with each other, um, which is a definition of a paradox. And um, it, it's really, uh, I, it can be really challenging at times. I think where, um, I think on this camp, like, you know, in my work, people know me. And so they know the identities that I hold. I try to articulate those. Um, up front while also articulating that, you know, if I, if I'm in a room of people of color or even, it doesn't really matter, but if I'm in a room of people of color, I will actually never call myself a person of color, but I will also never call myself white. Um, and I think that that's because there is, there's a lot that goes into identifying as a person of color. I don't experience racism in the same way um, because of my, my the complexion of my skin. Um, and if I'm in a room full of white people, I then, I, I, there's some sort of authority that they give me to speak on behalf of people of color that I can be difficult to navigate. Like I know a lot of the issues that people of color experience based on my work and my relationships with others. Um, but then I don't, but then how do you communicate, how do I communicate that in a way that I'm not also speaking for mm -hmm. them? Um, and so there's just, there's just a lot to manage. And I think for me, it, it involves a lot of intention setting. So anytime I'm doing a presentation that's diversity and inclusion related, I actually take about 15 minutes before um, to, to set intentions and to just be by myself. So like, what am I, what am I, how am I feeling today? What group am I meeting with? Um, how do I want to approach this? And then I will usually take some time afterward to do some deep processing on my own about how it went. What could I have done differently? Uh, where were some successes? What did I notice in the group? What were some data points that I, were, that I was picking up on? Uh, and so all of that is just really tiring. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, it's tiring. I mean, diversity and inclusion work is tiring anyway. Um, but I think for me, there's just a lot that I'm negotiating around, like where am I being not, where am I not being seen for my identities? why is that happening and how do I um, hold that while also then trying to communicate the work and help the group do, to do the work. Um, what, one of the things that I want to pull out from what you just said is that when we kind of intellectually know we're not supposed to speak for groups of people, it is also true that you could be speaking I could be speaking, we could be speaking from groups that we do feel a part of. So we're not speaking for a group, we're speaking from that group. Mm -hmm. But if we're not validated or perceived as from that group, then it becomes kind of this cultural competence conversation, which I don't necessarily support, instead of the cultural humility where you leave the door open mm -hmm. to listen and learn and kind of reflect on what's happening. Um, when I When I use the term cultural humility, uh, specifically in a medical setting, I'll talk about how like you've had the people in the audience, will have, you know, you've had all this education, you have all this experience and you need to bring that in to your patients, your colleagues, your, their family members and set it slightly to the side. And cultural humility is having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with that human being and recognizing that in this moment, they know more than you do. And so that's the, the leaving the door open, right? And when they give you the information, it can trickle through your experience and your knowledge. But the humility piece is recognizing that someone else knows themselves better. And that can be challenging when you're up in front of a room and they're expecting you to tell them information they need to know. Mm -hmm. So it, that's the part that I sometimes will... Um, in terms of trying to be culturally humble while I'm presenting and navigating the role of an authority or any sort of authority or expert on the, which I hate the word expert um, related to this work. 
is that that can be that's 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 part of the challenge for me uh -huh. um it, because if if groups are inviting you in they want you to tell information that they need to know to do their jobs better but also then you tell them well it kind of depends <laughs> um and that you there's no there's some, there are things that you can do that are more inclusive than other things but that ultimately each person is unique or even every circumstance requires you to be a lot more intentional. And I think that's the part that, you know, when we're, I think we're got caught up in these sort of business models that require us to think quickly. Um, we need evidence and then we need to deliver that the same way every time. Mm -hmm. And you just can't do that with human beings. I mean, of course you can't right? with human beings because we're not machines. So, um, Yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. But and so this, I call this the handout problem. Like I got asked last week, do you have a handout on eradicating <laughs> unconscious bias? <laughs> yeah. I was like, no, nope, sure don't. It's more of a practice, not a checklist. And that's what I tell people, right, is encouraging them. Like, so here, here are some, some simple phrases you can include and uh, phrases that you should not say. But really, if you're wanting to be an ally, if you're wanting to – improve the culture of your organization, you need to be regularly asking yourself these sets of questions, right? Um, so, you know, recently I did one, a presentation um, or a group facilitation around like the danger of a single story, which is from Chamama Di Adichie. And I'm like, for me, that looks like what story am I telling myself right now? How do I know that that story is true and what other stories exist? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and that's not, that's transformed not just my professional career, but my, who I am as a person mm -hmm. and how I'm able to interact with family members, with friends, um, with people on the street mm -hmm. uh, or people that, uh, everyday people that you meet. And um, I'm like, those are the questions that you have to reflect on regularly and constantly. And you will notice that that will then transform how you're doing the work. Mm -hmm. Because Absolutely. also, if you're not asking yourself those questions, I can tell you all that you need to do and I don't think actually anything will change. Hundred percent agree with you. It's interesting is that I just interviewed Ann Murdoch, who I will introduce you to, and uh, she was talking about how we're getting ready to transition into my favorite questions. And her first answer of my first favorite question, she was talking about how she got called out by being ableist because she had said something about um, someone being off their meds. Right. Mm -hmm. So she got called out on that and she was like, oh, my God, she, start, she found herself getting all defensive. And then she was like, you know what? You're right. Right. And the defense goes down. So then we had this conversation about exactly what you're talking about and that I always try to say when I feel defensive, specifically when I get defensive, is what are three other possibilities right now? Yeah. Right. So if somebody is off their meds, why would someone be off their meds that would actually be – valued by me right so like yeah. they're pregnant they don't have insurance right now they're they forgot to pick up their prescription like they ran late for work like there's side effects from this one to this one and there's like experimenting like you can very quickly come up with like three four five six seven possibilities and then i can't be defensive because now i'm back to humility i don't yeah. know this answer i need to ask more questions yeah. that's great are you ready for my favorite questions yes Number one, what have you changed your mind about lately? Ooh. Um, I don't know if I, gosh, changed my mind. It, um, there's a, a, a colleague that I um, have recently started um, interacting with and working with, and um, this person is very... very a part of their identity that they talk about a lot and that's really important to them is their Christian faith. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so this was recently in a training and we were having these conversations and what come, came up for me was this idea around like, what do symbols mean to other people? Um, and of course I knew this and, but it, it, I don't know, it occurred to me in a different way. And we were talking about like, um, you know, what symbols do we have in our offices that might communicate either connection to students or uh, a disconnect, like students would not be able to connect with us. And one of the symbols that came up was the rebel flag, the Confederate flag. 
Um, you know, along with that was like the, the MAGA Make America Great Again hat or Trump 22, you know, whatever um, his campaign stickers. And then someone shared something and it occurred to me that, you know, for, for so many people, the Confederate flag means slavery, it means oppression, all these sort of negative things. And what I was reminded of that was became, that I always knew, but I think hit and landed with me in a different way in that training was that the rebel flag can actually be, a, is, is a really large or really representative of hope for them. And so what it reminded me of is that there are so many people in this country that also like me are feeling a little hopeless. Mm -hmm. And we might have different ways of thinking of how we might find hope or things that will instill hope in us. We, and we have probably have very different lived experiences. Um, but so I don't know if I changed my mind, like, like, yes, the, re the rebel flag for me is a symbol of hope. But what I've changed my mind on is that, or it reminded me that what I find as like just unequivocally symbols of oppression or symbols of exclusion that again, there's no single story to that. Mm. And so what I have to, so even being thoughtful that, you know, for me, I have lots of, of course, rainbows um, <laughs> everywhere in my office. I also have Black Lives Matter uh, paraphernalia and uh, not paraphernalia, but symbols and buttons and stickers. Swag. And I like to call it swag. Shmag. Yeah, swag. And so, you know, so if a student is coming to me in my office, because I also teach a class um, here at Eastern, a stats class, if you can, rec yeah, I, I somehow got into it and now I teach it every quarter and it's fun and great. Number um, one, they're smart. Number two, they're cute. Number okay. three, they teach stats. Right. Boom. So, um, so students will have to come into my office in order to have office hours with me and so it's made me think about like, so if a student's coming in and they see Black Lives Matter and they are, you know, find them to be a terrorist organization, which there are some folks who believe that, how am I communicate, you know, are, in what ways are they put off? And yeah, so I feel like I'll, probably I'm going off like the deep, deep, I don't even know where I'm going right now, but I think the ultimate message is therefore that like really being thoughtful and considerate about like what are symbols of hope and how can, how thoughtful am I being about the symbols that I'm putting out there? And then how can I help other people um, connect with me, around, connect, connecting with each other around hope? What are we hoping for and how can we get there together? That's wonderful. It's, it's beautiful. And I think that it's a great example of how, when I ask the question, what have you changed your mind about lately? So many people interpret it as like, okay, when was the last time I was wrong about something? And what, what you're demonstrating and what I love about your style and just your approach to these type of conversations is you weren't wrong. You just hadn't thought about everything, you know, mm -hmm. which again, cultural humility. Okay, second favorite question and then lightning round. Okay, <laughs> okay second favorite question. What do you absolutely know? I, I absolutely know that, um, that we are all connected um that we that we that we as humans we are all deeply connected to one another even if we don't see it mm -hmm. um we are all deeply connected to our environments and to the world around us and so i, I just i i've studied this i guess um, in an academic sense um but i've seen i've seen this play out in my life um so the things that i'm doing the way that the way that even i treat myself impacts the people around me. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so one of my favorite quotes uh, from Gloria Anseldua is, I, I change myself, I change the world. Mm. And I, I have that in my email signatures. I put that in presentations. And for me, it means two things. One, it means that when I change something about myself, I no longer can see, I can't unsee that. I can't unchange that. I can ignore it. But once I know something and it's presented to me, I can't, I can no longer not know that. Yeah, absolutely. And typically for me, it means I now have a different viewpoint on whatever it is. And the other thing is when I change patterns of behavior that I know that are no longer serving me or that are toxic or that were a result of trauma, right? So we have coping mechanisms that we develop over time that just don't serve us anymore. Um, 
and can that potentially be harmful to others? Once I change that, I actually, and model that for other people, other people can pick up on that mm-hmm. and begin to either change that about themselves um, or, yeah, or begin to change that about themselves and see me attempting change and might therefore be willing, more willing to change. You know, my mom, you know, it, if, in many significant ways is such a different person than she is now or than she was when I, I'm sorry, she is now than she, when she was growing, when I was growing up. And, you know, what I tell her all the time, you know, she talks about like, you know, I was never a good enough mother and blah, 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 blah. I feel like a lot of parents probably have that narrative about themselves. And I told her, mom, the reason that I am where I am today is because I have seen you make such an incredible effort to be a different person than who you were. Mm. And while our process has been different and the things we've changed or are making changes to ourselves is different, I've seen that. And so what I need to change, it's just, I didn't realize that until a few years ago that that was what was happening. Um, And so I remind her of that. And so again, just reinforcing for me that, um, that Gloria Ansel do his quote, like I changed, I changed myself. I changed the world. We are ultimately what we do to ourselves and to each other um, is a result of deep connection. Mm -hmm. Oh, so good. Okay. It's very hard to tell an academic that the lightning round is coming up, but here we go. Okay. You randomly chose three numbers from my icebreaker cards. There's easy, intermediate, and deep. Number one is number 13. What is the story behind your name, legal, preferred, and or a nickname? Um, Yeah, I was almost Reyes Gutierrez Franco Jr., uh, named after my dad. So uh, that's not my name. So my middle name is my dad's first name, Reyes, Um, R-E-Y-E-S. In plural, it means kings. uh, El Reyes uh, in Spanish is king. And then um, Nicholas, uh, they just... Uh, there isn't a reason I don't think there's anything that inspired them to choose that name. But what I do know is that they um, repeated my name. They would, they yelled out my name. So if they ever needed to like get my, if I was ever in trouble as a kid, what would be the name that they would want to yell out? And Nicholas Reyes Franco was the one that, that really, they're like, yeah, if he's in trouble or if they're in trouble, that's the one that we're going to use. Excellent. Yeah. Number 17 intermediate. When and where have you experienced the most peace? Hmm. I think the most peace that I've ever experienced was um, San Diego. Uh, I was there for a number of years learning all the things. Um, And Black's Beach is one of my favorite beaches. And there was just this one day I went with my friend Jessica and indescribable it was just a perfect harmony of heat breeze the ocean was warm and beautiful and i felt like it was giving me a hug every time i went in i mean it just was that's where i felt like the most peace wonderful last one number 49 is deep what is your favorite holiday and why um favorite holiday Um, And this is so stereotypical of a professional gay or a a gay person, LGBTQ person, is Halloween. (laughs) Um, Halloween is considered like the high gay holiday. Uh, And the reason I I really like it, I think I liked it, um, it has a lot of memories for me and fond memories for me growing up. And I think what I also like about it is that there is a... um, Who I hang out with, we, we get really into it. And so there's this, like, you're taking on a persona. Um, I I see that my students really love it. And it's just an opportunity to be and express yourself in a way that maybe you don't feel like you can. Um, Every, at least in an everyday situation. Um, It reminds me a little bit of uh, Pride, a Pride Festival where people just come as they want to be and as Mm -hmm. they are. Um, And so that's what, that's what my, my Halloween kind of sticks out for me in that way. That's awesome. Well, again, thank you for everything you do and all the struggle it takes to do what you do. Thank you for being on uh, our Not Podcast. Um, (laughs) If people wanted to get in touch with you, how would they go about doing that? 
Best way is to connect with me on Facebook. My name on Facebook is Nick, N-I-C-K, and then Franco, F-R-A-N-C-O. Excellent. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a super great day. All right. Thanks, Jess. Bye.